Welcome aboard the Pacific Princess. Well, hello, Dan and Norma. Thank you for coming. Um, your cabin will be on the poop deck. No, it is not what it sounds like. You'd rather be on the Lido deck? All right, well, let me see what I can do. You're celebrating a special birthday? Why, well, happy birthday, Norma. I'm gonna get you a seat at the captain's table. Captain Stooping will be thrilled to meet you. In the meantime, head on over to the promenade deck and go to the bar. Isaac will fix you a drink. Yes, there's only one bar. And yes, there's only one bartender. But he's really, really good and he has it under control. And he's a great listener and he can tell you all about anything. Kayaking, banjo playing, fish wrapped in paper, and even um, uh, cross-country trail mix. Okay. See you there. Oh, I'm gonna put this down. Actually, maybe I won't yet. Welcome to Living Figuratively, everybody, with Judy, your cruise director. You may have caught some of my TV references. I think I kind of did a little overkill there, but I really wanted to wish happy birthday to Norma, who may be watching or may be watching later, because she might be out eating with her, with her honey right now. Anyway, welcome to Living Figuratively, the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Each week, I take you to a special corner of my house or my studio to tell you, to show you pieces from my collection or pieces of my own and how I fill my home with figurative art. Today, the special episode is called The Love Desk. And I'll tell you all about The Love Desk. Basically, okay, I've talked about in past episodes when my parents passed away, uh, which has now been four, more than four years ago. Um, we inherited a lot of stuff, including, you know, that bright yellow couch that was up in my studio that you saw on the book episode. Um, mountains of papers that became ephemera in my ephemera series paintings um, and a lot of furniture. Much of the furniture we donated because obviously we don't have room for a whole house full of furniture in a whole house full of furniture. But so like we donated it to things like the Cleveland Playhouse where I get a special kick out of seeing my um, mom's chair in a theater production that we go see. So like that's all that's really fun to see. Uh, so far I've seen like two chairs and one maybe her filing cabinet, though a lot of filing cabinets look alike. But one of the iconic pieces that I did decide to keep was her writing desk. Um, my mom was an author and an English professor, so the writing desk has a lot of sort of romance and history to it. And this desk had been sitting in my mom's bedroom for as long as I can remember. I'm sure she had it before I was, I was even born. And um, I have, because it's a writing desk and I don't use it as a writing desk, I use it as this beautiful accessory here. Um, and filled it with pictures and photographs of people that I love and that's why I call it the love desk. Now, how did this love desk come to be here and why is it here as opposed to other places? When we built this house, we had this little area here, which was a corner. And I had envisioned it as something that would ultimately have a corner cabinet in it. Um, I've always loved corner cabinets because they're just kind of cool and weird shaped and odd to put things in. You can't put books in it or anything like that, but they're like a cabinet with a personality. So I envisioned a corner cabinet in this, you know, in this corner um, that I would sort of eternally search for. Uh, when, for me, building a house and decorating a house, it's kind of like this living, ever-evolving process where it's almost like creating a painting where you can actually curl up and crawl inside your painting when you're done painting it. And it's really sort of the process and the search that are more fun than finding, finding the right piece and then being done with that area. 
So I kind of envisioned searching the, you know, the, the world over for the next bunch of years um, for this perfect corner cabinet. I never did end up finding the perfect corner cabinet. I did end up hanging paintings in this corner and, you know, because I've got lots of paintings. Um, and so at, at, at some point I was kind of like, well, I can't really put a corner cabinet because it would be too high and I'd have to put smaller paintings and move them and everything. So I just kind of gave up the whole corner cabinet idea. Then in 2016, um, my parents passed away and we spent the next nine months cleaning out their house and figuring out what to do with the furniture, passing it along, keeping it. Um, you know, my sister and I basically looking at each other saying, you know, you take that, no, you take that. And, you know, somebody eventually would say, you know, okay, I'll take it. So that's why I ended up with a lot of stuff. I wanted to take her drawing desk or her um, writing desk and this ended up being the perfect place for it. You know, as soon as I decided to take it, I was like, all right, that's going to be the perfect place for it. So I set up this little display with the family photographs. And one of the things that also made this corner perfect was I have these two paintings here that are, you know, kind of the, the quintessential paintings that I created during the time that my parents were passing away, you know, the before, during, and after time. The two paintings are Cancer Honeymoon over here and then Guardian Angel of the Good Death over here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Cancer Honeymoon first, which um, basically Cancer Honeymoon was created right at the beginning process, right almost right away when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Uh, when my mom was diagnosed, she, she ultimately did end up passing away from ovarian cancer, but she spent four years living with ovarian cancer and all the, you know, cancer cliches like the fighting it, the warrior, being, you know, valiant, being brave, being, taking, making memories, taking care of your affairs, all those things, making the most out of everything, you know, the times you're healthy, um, all those things happened over the course of her last four years. In the beginning, um, when she very first started chemo, which was very soon after she was diagnosed, she lost all her hair. And so for my mom, that wasn't, that wasn't a big deal. That was like not a big deal at all as, and, you know, compared with all the other cancer issues. In fact, she kind of got a kick out of having no hair. It just was zero maintenance. She didn't have to fix her hair or anything like that. Um, she just wore her turban most of the time. She did have a wig which she wore like, I guess for super special occasions, but mostly she wore the turban and just, you know, that was, that was fun. Um, she was my number one muse. I painted her a whole, whole bunch of times. And uh, when I knew that she was gonna be bald, I knew that she would be really interesting looking. And she was very into it when I asked her if she would pose for some, you know, bald pictures. And, um, and so, and she took to the role with like great relish. She was, you know, an actress type person, even though she wasn't an actress, kind of like me, um, you know, actress type, but maybe not an actual actress. Um, and, but so like she did all kinds of expressions and I had her include her beautiful knobby arthritic hands, which I've always loved, loved, loved painting. Um, and so at the, at the, the end of the photo shoot, I assembled this triptych of, um, of images and I called it Cancer Honeymoon because to me, that's a term that I think I made up, but maybe I didn't. Um, the Cancer Honeymoon to me is sort of the early stages of when you're very first diagnosed and you're kicking you know, kicking cancer's butt, you're, you're getting your treatments, your numbers are doing well, people are being extra nice to you, you get to see your family a lot more because, you know, they, they're starting to appreciate you. They are taking you to chemo every other week, so you get to see them then. And, um, and it's sort of like, it's not a fun time, but there's, there's good times to be had during that sort of early time, especially because, you know, you don't, 
feel like crap all the time. You feel like crap sometimes, but then when you don't feel like crap, you're elated because you don't. Um, so I, you know, I call that the cancer honeymoon time. And the three, the three images of my mom in the triptych are um, curing from left to right. I don't know which is left and which is right, but it is uh, curiosity because she was a big researcher. She like looked up everything about it, every website, every, you know, all kinds of printouts with like millions of questions for the doctors and stuff. Um, and then acceptance because she really, she wasn't in any kind of denial. She was hopeful that, you know, she'd be on the better end of the statistics, but um, she was not in denial. And then humor, you know, she was definitely a very positive outlook, you know, that, that sort of spunky, we're gonna beat this kind of thing um, attitude. So that's, that's why I have the three for the Cancer Honeymoon. Oh, and the reason it's called Cancer Honeymoon is because just like a honeymoon where you very first get married, um, the statistics might not be with you, you know, I don't know what the latest statistics are on how many marriages survive, but it's like something like only 50%. Uh, but you're definitely hopeful that you're going to be on the good end of the statistics. And it's sort of that newness of it, how cancer is going to fit into your life, affect your life, change your life, make you more appreciative, you know, it, there's all kinds of hopefulness and positive, positivity, much like when you very first get married. Um, so that's why I called it Cancer Honeymoon. This painting um, is going nowhere. It's now here permanently. It has traveled a little bit. It's, you know, been actually one best in show at the um, Lord Deckenstein show a bunch of years ago. Uh, but now it's, you know, so it's, it's not it's not available for sale or anything like that. But G-Clays of it are available on my website. The other painting that... I did during the uh, the time when my parents were passing away. This one was much later than Cancer Honeymoon. This one is called The Guardian Angel, The Good Death. And this painting was done, uh, it was actually done after the fact because it was kind of hard to do paintings during this tumultuous time. Um, there, was a, there was a time period probably like a month and then it also six months um, where I never knew, you know, like I was dreading when the phone rang. Whenever the phone rang, it meant something, something bad was going to happen or something bad had already happened. And then I'd have to drop everything, rush to the hospital, um, drop everything, pick people up, take care of things. It was, it was a very um, tumultuous time with a lot of uncertains, a lot of unknowns, a lot of, you know, should I make this plan? Should I not make this plan? Should I put down a deposit on the thing? Or should I not do that? Um, you know, how long do we have? Do we have months? Do we have years? Um, and I, I came to figure out that not only did I have to make sure that my parents lived well, I also had to make sure that they died well, because um, it ultimately is inevitable when you have aged parents and you're lucky enough to see them into old age that's you know it's coming and so the guardian angel of the good death uh, I have reference of myself before and after because at one point in the process um, after my dad died but before my mom died I cut my hair and it wasn't any kind of a Britney Spears, you know, little freak out kind of thing or, and it really wasn't even sort of a, a mourning gesture. It really was just sort of a simpler, um, simpler concept where I had wanted to have short hair for a while and I just never really wanted to take the plunge. And when things kind of get cut to their core, like, you know, the, the, silly things don't matter anymore and it's just sort of like you're at the at the core of what really the heart of what really is important you're kind of like it's just hair i'm gonna cut it if i don't like it it's gonna grow back and after i cut it i haven't looked back since and it's you know stayed short except for during covid where you know it got a little bit scruffy and unruly um and I was cutting everybody's hair in my family, but I wouldn't let anybody return the favor and cut mine. So I just waited until it was, coast was clear. 
and I could go to the salon and get it done. Um, with a mask on, of course. And my hairstylist also had a mask. Um, so that is, that is it for tonight. I am basically thanking you for joining me tonight. Um, I wanted to remind you that any painting sales during this time, and you know, there's Giclees of these are both available. Um, Guardian Angel of the Good Death is available through 33 Contemporary on artsy.net. So that's where the original painting is available and Giclees of both are available on my website. And any sales that happen during this time, I am paying forward 50% into the struggling art community uh, because the COVID struggles are just, they keep on going. And, you know, I hope we don't have like a second wave, but who knows, who knows how it's all gonna be. So join, be sure to join me next week. Next week, we're gonna actually set another course for adventure and um, go on location. We're going on location to the Group 10 Gallery in Kent for the seventh annual um, regional, yeah, regional juried show, which I and uh, I juried along with Jen Omitz, who is a phenomenal Cleveland artist. We juried it together, and we just gave out the prizes together last week, which I don't know if those have been publicized yet. But um, next week, next Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going on location to the gallery. And the gallery is not going to be open, but I'll do a little walkthrough and um, show you the figurative art in the, from the show, or some of the figurative art from the show. And, um, and I'm very much looking forward to it, and I hope that you will join me too. Same bat time, same bat channel. 6 p.m. next Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Y'all come back now, you hear?